Hey, this is Brett from the F and Good Music blog on Instagram, and I'm your new host for the Music That Matters podcast, which is brought to you by the Society of Sound Music Media. I hope you enjoy. Something that kind of like piques my curiosity was that your name is Max Clark. And for me, I feel like that's the, the songwriter's dream, that name, you know? <laughs> Two syllables, you know, it's like, you already sound like you could be famous. Why um, pick this alter ego? One of the first things that I was wondering, so I was digging through, you know, the internet a little bit, doing some research, and uh, I found that cutworms is, uh, by definition, moth larvae that hide under litter or soil during the day, coming out in the dark to feed on plants. And so something that kind of like piques my curiosity was that your name is Max Clark. And for me, I feel like that's, the the songwriter's dream that name you know <laughs> two syllables you know it's like you already sound like you could be famous why um pick this alter ego uh i don't know i mean i guess i just never really thought of that of my name as as being that um and i don't know i guess like it was it went through a bunch of iterations kind of it was like it used to be max clark and the cutworms um but then that was just too big of a mouthful um and i don't know for whatever reason i've i've just always never felt that uh comfortable like saying my own name or like i don't know it was somehow easier to be able to like separate um, that from like my own personal life a little bit, I guess. That's pretty interesting, yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way too, Um, especially when they, you know, go by, you know, like another name when they're creating something that might not always be who they are in their personal life. You know, a lot of people Mm -hmm. tend to take on a character or characters that aren't necessarily them that they're just trying to express through their music. Do you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I guess I think, um, I don't know there, I guess maybe there's just a a bit more freedom in, uh, feeling like, you know, you, it, it's something that could be anything rather than, you know, um, and the, There's just something kind of like uh, that feels sort of like gross a little bit to me of like, uh, like branding oneself. Like I've never liked that whole process of, or part of like, it's an, it's an unavoidable part of like, if you're going to release music or, or whatever into the world, like, and like tour and, put out records and everything is like you have to essentially brand yourself or either that or someone's going to brand you for you um and uh yeah the i don't know there's like a a desire uh and uh what's the word i'm looking for like a um tendency to want to uh keep some part of yourself uh sacred or something like that um, right. did yeah. you feel that uh did you feel that maybe because i know that you're from ohio um did you feel that maybe coming to new york you kind of wanted to keep who you were at home kind of your to like you know yourself and not necessarily uh bring everything to new york um I don't know. I mean, I was before New York, I was in Chicago for eight years um, and was kind of doing variations of the same thing there. I I guess I didn't, I probably didn't really think about it that much. I could just like 
came up with a it was more so at the at the beginning i think just coming up with a band name because i feel like people are generally more interested in a in a band than they are or a group mm. than they are in just a single person um sometimes I yeah think. i don't know well when you were talking about you know um kind of branding yourself i think that you know today with social media and everything it's like you know like you said if you don't brand yourself someone else is going to brand you and um i know that i've noticed that you know a lot of artists along with being musicians and songwriters and you know this like really vulnerable creator you also have to you know be a content creator and you have to like have a personality and you have to right. create this like extra bit of yourself for everybody else to see and so I definitely yeah, think that yeah. a lot of, yeah. I mean, that's like, so, and some people are really good at that, you know? I mean, t the people that tend to be more popular are the ones that are, are comfortable with doing that and, and being like a personality and, and, and that whole thing. Right. Um, Do you think that in music, um, you know, that, uh, trend has sort of taken away kind of the mystique of a musician and you know the the anonymity of who somebody is behind the scenes and for me I think yeah I mean it's like um any of the artists that I've that I like or have liked in my life um well it's a little different because a lot of them are were kind of before my time, but um, even so, it's like, um, I just don't want to know a lot. Of, like, I, I don't understand like the, um, the desire for people to like, um, want to like feel like they're friends with the, the, the art, the person who's like making music or art or whatever it is like, everybody feels like they all have to be like interacting on like a personal level. Um, but it's also like most of the time over the internet. So it's really not that personal, but still it's like this weird gray area. I don't know. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, I understand the impulse, I guess, of wanting to know more personal details about artists or whatever you know I, I I always like to read like biographies and autobiographies of like musicians and any that you could uh recommend because I, I also I just got finished with the Joey Ramone biography I'm on Frank Zappa right now oh nice um well I, I just recently read um Tommy James oh um, and the Shondells yeah uh his is pretty good that's pretty cool it's I didn't called, know if there was uh, enough to really put a biography because, I mean, you know, I, I don't know too much other than, you know, Crimson and Clover. Um, oh, I don't yeah, know too I mean, much about his life. He had a string of, of pretty big hits in the 60s aside from that one. Um, and his story is pretty interesting just because he was on Roulette Records, which was essentially run by the literal mob. Um, mm. Like they were they were mafia guys <laughs> and yeah. he kind of, I mean, he was a classic example of an artist who, you know, was kind of wide eyed going as a kid, basically getting signed. He got, he had like one hit and then basically the, the guy Morris Levy who ran the label, um, you know, just hoarded all of the profits and like mm -hmm. gave him a pittance of it. Um, which is a you know a story you see over and over, especially from that era. But um, yeah, it's a it's a good read though. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah, when you were talking about that, someone else that I thought of it wasn't quite the same, but it was a little bit you know a wide eyed young artist, at, like goes into the mus music industry, gets a lot of fame, gets the spotlight, but then finds out you know they don't want it, and that was like Scott Walker a bit and. Uh -huh. um, and he kind of, you know, became a bit of a recluse after that and really kind of, you know, started a whole avant-garde movement that, you know, is 
been one of the most influential musicians. So yeah, I don't I don't know a ton about Scott Walker. I know I mean I know some of his stuff, and I know some of the early um, the Walker Brothers mm -hmm. tunes that uh, they did. They were like borderline. Uh, they were kind of like the Righteous Brothers um, in that yeah. vein of like in working with like Phil Spector and Gold Star Studios in the '60s and like that whole deal. Um, yeah. Well, something something that actually really intrigued me about your music, and I've seen you know from following you, just even like the little bit that you post on Instagram, I've noticed that you are like me, a bit of an encyclopedic. Uh, person when it comes to music and really, you know, digging into the roots of music and kind of fleshing it out from its beginning, you know, um, people tend to l just like quickly label that as an old soul, but I think that there's a lot more to it. And, um, you know, is there anything that you can say about kind of your journey about, you know, learning music and diving super deep into it? And then, you know, how that reflects in your process of creating it for yourself. Um, well, I, I don't know, when I was younger and first discovering a lot of different kinds of music, uh, I was, I just got really interested and really obsessed with like, uh, the, the sort of lineage of certain things of like, uh, you know, you, I would get into like one group or something, you know, getting into like blues based rock and roll that was really popular in the 60s and 50s. And then like from there going back and seeing like, like the original, um, all the blues and country and folk that, that it evolved out of. Um, and even before that, like, you know, big band era uh, stuff and like early rhythm and blues and even like as far back as like the 20s and like show tunes and the the old crooners and, and all that stuff. And because it all, to me, I don't know, it's just fascinating how it all evolved into different things, but it it all kind of feels of one peace to me uh like and i don't um like it all it all feels like fresh still to me um, yeah i couldn't i actually couldn't agree more something that uh has always sort of confused me is when people kind of talk about you know music that was made even 20 years ago 30 years ago as if it's like ancient history you know people look at nirvana now like it's a classic rock band that, you know, like everything is slowly just becoming this like sort of ancient history. And I, and it confuses me just because, you know, like, for example, I would say that, you know, for the most part, rock music as a large, you know, genre has kind of run its course in a sense in that mm -hmm. there's so, been so much ground that's covered that now it's really starting to kind of come back and really flesh out niche areas of specific movements and, you know, people look at a lot of, you know, like, for example, hip hop, hip hop is about to run sort of the equivalent. I mean, you know, if you take it back to the early 80s, you know, it's been over 40 years now that hip hop has really been developing. And in 10 years, it's going to be 50 years old. And so when that runs its course, you know, what will be the new, you know, relevant music that everybody is kind of, uh, you know, obsessing over? and looking at it like it's the like it's the best thing since sliced bread and that you know like yeah. everything else is just irrelevant um so you know and i hear a lot of like hank williams in your music especially you know your vocals it's very um neil young-esque i know that i've i've said before um and so yeah um it just it it was very refreshing because along with this vintage sound that you hold there's also um a certain freshness that you just mentioned that, you know, has still existed just with great artists, you know, they never really um, kind of uh, age, I guess. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's, I think it's definitely a matter of opinion for, for most people, uh, whether 
things, uh, the definition of what's new or, or fresh or any of those type of terms. But yeah, it's like, um, for me, I don't know. I, I can only just really do what I like. I like make what I would want to hear, I think. Um, and to some extent, I have some control over it, but so I can't really be anything that I'm not. Um, right. So I'm just, yeah. Well, I mentioned um, Hank Williams before, and you've talked about, you know, a lot of your influence, even like pre the rock and roll explosion of the 60s. Do you think that there was like kind of some sort of unfinished business to be done in that, you know, 40s and 50s folk, you know, more traditional style music that kind of almost seems like it, you know, it was stopped short with rock and roll in a lot of ways, I think, at least. Um, yeah, I mean... As far as like unfinished business, uh, I mean, there's, there's been like, you know, I, I used to think like I got really, uh, Buddy Holly was a big one for me um, mm -hmm. when I discovered him going through, he was like a pretty formative presence in my like learning how to write, I guess. Um, like, I feel like a lot of my songs kind of, like, I would think of, um, like, I, I was trying to maybe do what Buddy Holly m would have maybe done had he not died. Um, mm. uh, like, what he would have done in the 60s or 70s, you know. Um, so you think he would have continued kind of on a on a more country and folk based music. He wouldn't have gone with, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just like one, um, thought that I had that it's, that's, I wouldn't say that's like my mission statement or anything. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean like stuff like that, I get curious about, or as far as like, uh, older, stuff like you mentioned um folk stuff i mean i think it's it's really all of just like one big long tradition in my mind of like 20th century song um and like the only differences a lot of the time in my mind are just like um the arrangements and like the instrumentation and the, the latest gadgets that the people were into at the time like a lot of the song structures and stuff are really not that different over the past hundred years even you know mm -hmm. um up until like kind of really recently like some of the like really new pop um, and top 40 stuff, like, I can't even really wrap my head around the structures a lot of the times because, like, I think it's because they're, a lot of them are written by, like, 20 people in, like, mm -hmm. this, like, producer collaboration thing, and then there's also, like, you know, there's, like, a hook every three seconds or something, you know, it's, like, it's just, it's gotten very, um, sort of convoluted and like like hyper zoomed in or something um yeah i think a bit of that has to do with um our lack of attention span potentially these days and kind of the need to yeah. not be able sure. to like sit and maybe just like listen to a verse you know you need a constant hook that will uh -huh. always keep you in attention especially for those you know top 40 songs because uh you know I mean, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of kids, I'd say, um, mm -hmm. and certainly certain adults. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that, you know, you kind of hit it right there with pop music potentially. But um, I don't know, do you think that pop music could, uh, you know, like maybe not turn back the clock, but, uh, you know, 
go again towards that traditional style you were just mentioning? Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's like, I hate to be like a, a Luddite, if you know that term, of just like, uh, you know, wanting to remain in, in the past or something or like keep things like traditional or, or like a, a purist of some kind or something. I don't know. Like, I'm still interested in, in pop music and stuff. And like, I, there's, there's songs on top 40 radio that I'll hear and I like. Um, I, I couldn't really name any of them off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I mean, my own personal taste is just, uh, I guess just like simpler things. Um, even like the, I don't know, o older stuff from like 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s um, and 90s, like um, there, there was like, it has something to do with melody to me. It's like having like a, like a pure melody. Um, uh, I think a lot of the newer stuff like even though it even when it they're trying to like make it like something new and they're doing like a million things at once and there's like a 20 melodies going on like i can still like kind of pick out like where each thing is coming from melody wise like and it doesn't strike most of them don't strike me as like all that being all that original really and i guess that's what, what sometimes doesn't um move me or whatever uh i think and you know nothing is really all all that original yeah, you, definitely but uh i don't know it's hard to talk about it. it's like it really has to do with like how it's done and right. um, like do you think that maybe it's like the approach to music as sort of like a product rather than you know like a piece of art that you know like is made by one or just like a small group of people like a band co-writing where it's kind of become this like well what can we do to this song to make it you know jump to you know get people to listen to it and it's like you know, it's like a business board meeting of like 20 people who all work for this record label who are all sitting down, you know, passing around a sheet, writing down lyrics and, you know, trying to like make it this like, this like, this perfectly wrapped type of thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know enough about how modern uh, writing things go on on, on at that high, at those high levels of, um, with like, you know, corporate interests and stuff being involved. Um, you know, that, I, I, that world is totally foreign to me. So I couldn't really say how, I don't know how that stuff works, but I, I mean, even, even older, like, you know, a lot of the music that I like, um, it's kind of relative in my mind, like, you know, the, they were arguably done in like kind of a uh, conveyor belt, like assembly line style too. You know, they had like teams of writers who were writing songs and then they had producers and, you know, people in like the Brill building or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, kind of churning out songs. Um, well, you do have a bit of experience, though, with, you know, being on a record label. I mean, you know, Jag Jaguar is in uh, Capitol Records, but it is pretty, uh, it's it's a pretty well-established label. And I'm sure that, you know, well, you're, you know, your uh, album is uh, it's close to, what is it, 80 minutes about? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, you know, when you were making Nobody Lives Here Anymore, I'm sure that there was a bit of, uh, you know, well, is there any way you can cut it down, you know? stuff like that going on yeah i mean there's a, you know. a little bit of that but i mean they they i mean they're pretty great like they'll 
Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have to do a ton of convincing to like, um, I just kind of like told them what my vision for it was and they were, they were cool with it, which was, which was great. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's like, um, yeah, for, in that particular instance, like, I just really wanted to put out as much as I could. Um, I don't know, just, uh, I had all of these songs mostly formed, some of them more so than others, but um, I don't know, rather, like it, it takes so long to put something out and put something together that um, by the time you do that, it's like you're kind of already like sick of the material and that, and then you have to like go on tour for like however long to like promote it and, and then really beat the dead horse into the ground. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure in 2020 though, it was, you know, um, did you, do you think that maybe you took that feeling for granted a bit, not being able to tour all year and did you miss it a bit? And do you wish that you were performing these songs? I mean, there's been moments, yeah, where I've, I've missed it. Um, but I mean, really, to be honest, it was kind of a relief not having to mm -hmm. like face the prospect of like going on another like eight month tour. Um, it's just like, I don't know, it's really hard on, on you, on me, like mentally and physically even. It's like, mm -hmm. um, it, like touring for nine, you know, nine months out of a year wasn't the reason that I got into this. Um, yeah, I just I'm I'm more like writing and recording. Um, I do like playing live, um, but you know, you can you can overdo anything. Definitely. Um, well, so that kind of brings me to my next question. Uh, you have the music video for "Sold uh, My Soul," "Sold My Soul," and so what I'm thinking from like you know basically my impression so far is that making a music video for you is not your cup of tea and that uh, it might be something that's a bit of a drag. So, you know, how is that? Well, I mean, it's like in theory, I, you know, I like the idea of doing it and everything. I'm just not that comfortable in front of a camera mm -hmm. really. Um, and I don't feel like I, I come across as all that natural or um, like looking that uh, nice or, <laughs> or something. I don't know. I hear a little bit of Elliot Smith in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's like that was that one particularly was fun. Um, because Caroline, my partner, like shot and directed it and it was pretty much just us and we did it with um, my uncle who is the older gentleman in the, in the video and, um, you know, drove across the country to, because he lives in Oklahoma, um, with, the, with the idea of, of shooting it with him and, um, so, I mean, that whole process was like fun and a good experience, but um, it's taken some getting used to uh, as far as, it's just really hard to come up with an idea that's, um, that's not like corny and, and been done a million times, I guess, right. in terms of music videos. It's like music videos are not high art, yeah. generally speaking um most of the time like they there are cool ones that have been done but it's it's pretty easy to like fall into like really cliche type things that just don't feel that good right. to me 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely get that. And, you know, I've read, a, I've read a, about a lot of artists that I really admire and they have similar thinking. Um, you know, specifically, I'm a, I'm a huge Replacements fan. And uh, they, like, didn't put out a music video until their last album, which, like, is, you know, it, it was pretty disappointing to look at because they don't have a lot of live footage to begin with because they wouldn't right. let people film them, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, so digging through the archives of the replacements, you know, you're not able to really visually see all the history that is so, you know, like legendary as it's been told, mm -hmm. um, which maybe adds to the mystique we were talking about. But um, yeah, I know that, you know, like one of their more famous music videos that they got on to MTV was a camera sitting in front of a couch with just a shot of their legs. And that was the entire yeah. thing. Yeah, I remember reading or watching something about that where like their their record label was pissed because they had them do a video and then they weren't in the video. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, it was just like a shot of like a cigarette burning and like a speaker or something like that. Yeah, now uh, I think that like they have like three different songs that they put to that uh, vi to that video because you know there's nobody lip syncing or anything so right yeah <laughs> um but yeah also sold um sold my soul was smack in the middle of your record eight songs on both sides is there a significance behind that um as far as the where it is on the record yeah i guess the placement and maybe the selection of that song to make the music video um well that was one that um one of the first ones first songs that was done um uh, at the beginning of making this record and it was one that the label the guys at the label were immediately excited about and saw potential as a single mm -hmm. um which is so i don't always know what what's a single and what's not like so Sometimes I'll feel like something could be a good single, but then like other people will think that, it, that a, another one is. Sometimes I I, I have an idea, but um, but that one, yeah, it was like it was done early on, and yeah, they were excited about it, and I felt like it just kind of lent itself to doing like a sort of fun video. Yeah, like it wasn't. It, it's not like a joke song necessarily, but it's like there's humor in it and it's not, um, doesn't take itself too seriously, which is like, it's kind of hard to, to do a video sometimes of like a, a really like, um, like I was okay with kind of just like letting it do be whatever it was going to be, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. For me, uh, the single was the he's on. That's what I personally would have picked. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. That's like, uh, probably my favorite song that you've done. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the build up to the chorus is like fantastic. And I love that. It, I mean, I don't know if, uh, you actually were like trying to play on this, but like, you know, that song that's like, the heat is on. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. for some reason like kind of what I was thinking, but you know, it it brings it in obviously a completely different direction. Um that, and like, I was thinking song? Yeah, that like 80s yeah. song. Um Yeah, I mean there's like Yeah, I've, a number of my songs all I've taken titles from or you know, I didn't I didn't like take the title from something else, but I called it something that another song was already called that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough these days. There's pretty much every, you know, everything's already been named. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Like that's that turn of phrase that he is on is like a pretty old one. It's like, I was mm -hmm. more thinking of like the, um, the context of, uh, like old, those old like film noir movies, like um, detective movies and stuff. Like uh, there's one called The Big Heat, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then there's Heat. 
with uh, De Niro and Pacino. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. Also, you know, sort of like a pun on uh, global warming. Um, it's interesting because I kind of get like a bit of a like a love song vibe from it. Um, you know, guy and a girl, heat is building. Um, so it's yeah, interesting it could, that you've mentioned everything nice other than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now that you're like in New York, um, what do you see in the New York music scene right now in the New York community as far as music goes? Just because I feel like there's something that's beginning to stir a bit um, as far as New York artists go. Um, I don't really... I don't feel all that connected to it uh, right now. I mean, part of it is not really being, you know, for one, nobody's been playing any shows for over a year. Um, mm -hmm. And even before that, I wasn't playing a ton of shows um, in New York. Like I, I kind of only really, um, the only like instance of like a New York scene, I guess I was like when I first moved here that, that I saw of like kind of playing some more DIY type shows. Um, but like they, um, that ended pretty quickly, I guess. Like a lot of the places shut down um, this was even before the pandemic. There was just like, I feel like DIY spots just don't really last very long around here. Yeah. Um, I think partially because it's like pretty expensive to live here. Um, but, and then also like I signed to a record label and then started um, just playing tons of shows, like opening for other bigger bands that were or like well as more well established bands that were like just touring through New York. Um, is there anybody was, that you is there anybody that you opened for that you you know like particularly admired? Um, I mean, I opened for a lot of people that that I like. Uh, I mean, uh, opening for Nick Lowe was really cool. That's um, amazing. I've always admired him as a writer and musician. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot. Um, I'm kind of blanking on. I know that uh, you uh, opened once for Kevin Morby, who's mm -hmm. a kind of who's a contemporary artist who you know like is in a similar vein as you, um, as far as a songwriter goes, I'd say. Um, so yeah, are there like, you know, you mentioned like a lot of older artists. Are there any contemporary artists who you? maybe not are inspired by, but kind of, you know, appreciate and maybe draw even a little bit of influence from? Um, I mean, they're, yeah, people that I've like, that am friends with kind of, and that play music um, mainly. I mean, and people that I've toured with, like we toured with uh, this band called Shy Boys from Kansas City. And they're one of my favorite contemporary bands like um i feel like i'm i am have taken some influence from them um they just they they do a lot of really great like harmonies and stuff um and then uh yeah like people even that are like in my band like john andrews um and the yawns like he's just came out with a new record i think today it came out or either it's today or tomorrow it comes out um but his stuff is really great um yeah uh kind of just friends i'm like mm -hmm. i get inspired by my friends doing stuff many yeah. people who have made a huge impact on music have gone through memphis to record um you know what was it like being in that city with you know, all that history, did you, you know, absorb a lot of that? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really cool, especially, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I could say that I definitely felt like the, the historical implications uh, of it. And, you know, you kind of feel the spirit of everybody that's come out of there and gone through there, um, especially because uh, the producer I worked with, Matt Ross Spang, uh, working out of Sam Phillips' studio there. I mean, Sam Phillips is like, they call him the man who discovered rock and roll. It's like, it doesn't get much more like pure rock and roll than, than that. And like mm -hmm. being to be able to record in his studio that he built, um, where like, you know, amazing people have recorded uh, everybody from like, Yardbirds and like Alex Chilton to Bob Dylan and yeah, um, so yeah, I'm sure that that was that was really amazing to kind of be in that presence because you know personally I've been to Motown actually and you know even just being in that museum which is basically just the restored studio that they've just kept everything there you know even being there you you feel it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that that had an impact on your music, on the actual recording of it and the, you know, the, the, yeah, the physicality of it? Um, I mean, maybe. I wasn't thinking about it that much um, at the time. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it's just a, a cool thing that's to be, um, to experience and like, um, I don't know, like this Sam Phillips studio down there, it's cool because it's like, it w was very historical and like, you know, some, some of the giants of rock and roll and music of the past 50, 60 years have come out of there, but at the same time, it didn't feel like it was like this pristine thing that you couldn't touch. Like I was playing a piano that Jerry Lee Lewis had played, but I, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't afraid to like touch it, you know, um, which is, I don't know. There was something kind of, I don't know, like magical about that a, a little bit. Um, Because yeah, you know, it's it's easy to like mythologize all of that um, stuff and all those people um, because they are, so many of them were like, you know, larger than life type of figures, but they were all just people too, kind of just rolling through and doing stuff. Well, yeah, like bring it full circle you know like what would jerry lee lewis have been like had he had an instagram page where you know he had to promote himself and uh kind of talk about his personality you know does that yeah i mean like i, I think we've pretty much established that you know um everybody is a human being that you know is more or less fairly uninteresting um when it really comes down to it yeah, well, I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis in particular, I would, I would have loved to see his Instagram page. <laughs> that guy is not a boring person. <laughs> <laughs> He's out there. Yeah, Bob Dylan for that fat, for that matter. I don't. Th I think Bob Dylan would have. Uh, he would have said, "I'm not. I don't have an Instagram page." Right. Yeah. <laughs> he could have one right now if he wanted to, but he doesn't. Yeah, and I'm sure if he and I actually I think he does, but I'm sure that it's run by anybody other than Bob Dylan. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, people of, of his uh, stature are they generally all have their accounts run by whatever marketing teams and stuff like that. I think uh, I think Paul McCartney might be the only guy that does it himself, just because he probably loves it. <laughs> right yeah he's Paul he's uh, very personable <laughs> yeah um, so I guess like to wrap this up um, you know I kind of want to bring this back to the fact that you're from Ohio and now you're living in New York for quite a bit now but you know a lot of people who are from anywhere that isn't near a big city 
or well i mean you know there's cleveland and stuff like that but people from the middle of the country um a lot of people come to new york with a wide-eyed uh youthful face looking to you know kind of start a new life um do you have any uh truthful experiences that might say whether uh new york is all it's cracked up to be to a certain extent i mean in my experience it is because uh you know i was doing more or less the same exact thing when i was living in chicago and kind of just not going nowhere and nothing was happening and then within like in like no time it was like within a a month or two of moving to New York, I was like, I had met so many people and was like playing bigger shows and like being introduced to like record label people and like all, there was just no like, um, I had no real entry into like the quote unquote industry of it. And I didn't know anything about it either. Um, you know, like when I lived in Chicago, I, I, uh, maybe if I was just more savvy, you know, there, there's people, bands come out of Chicago that are bigger than me, but, um, like, I just didn't know anything. Uh, like, I had, like, at one point, I remember when I lived there, I, like, had, was, like, knocking on the door of, like, a, a booking agency, like, trying to talk to them and they were like what are you doing like we don't we don't take appointments like <laughs> uh i just had no concept of like how anything worked or like it's just one of those things i think you kind of have to be like connected in somehow um or you have to meet at least like one or two people who are connected and like know the ropes a little bit um so and there's a lot of those type of people here in New York. Um, uh, so I guess, you know, in that respect, it's uh, that, you know, that part is true. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's that suffices. Um, it was great. It was great meeting you and speaking with you. You're clearly a very intelligent guy who's well versed in a lot of aspects of life, music, literature. Um, so I'm looking Thanks. forward to your future work. I'm sure Thank that it'll you. be. I'm sure it'll be good. I hope so. <laughs>